Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have John Moody of Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund to talk about his experience with the food freedom movement. John is a husband, father to four, small farmer, author, and speaker. After serving on the board of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, he was asked to serve as interim executive director and now full executive director. Congratulations and thank you, by the way. John has participated in the small farming and food freedom movement in many ways over the years, serving as administrator for one of the largest local food buying clubs in the nation, the Whole Life Buying Club. He acted up by standing up with the members of that buying club to unjust enforcement actions that denied them access to real food, protesting the FDA's harassment of farmers and consumers seeking real food. John regularly speaks across the nation on matters related to food, health, and farming. He and his family steward the 35 acres that they like to call some small farm. Welcome to the show today, John. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, had you known me back in high school or college, you would never have thought you would find (laughs) me here today. Oh, my gosh. I I am like the least likely candidate for somebody to be involved with real food and farming that you can find Mm -hmm. in the United States. I was your typical video game playing, um, Chips Ahoy cookie eating, Dorito inhaling, (laughs) you know, four processed food groups was my diet Uh for most of the first few decades of my life until in my early 20s. I developed um, some severe health problems mm. that, that culminated in a condition known as duodenal ulcers. Oh, wow. That um, doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's a lot like if you remember the one alien movie where the alien creature pops <laughs> out of the chest of the person. Uh-huh. It's a lot like that, only it happens five or six times a day. Oh, my gosh. Um, you, you know, So I'm, I'm in my early 20s. I'm in the middle of working on my master's degree, and I'm just racked by – unremitting, unrelenting pain. Oh. So I go to a doctor and, you know, I had, a, I had a doctor who I felt was pretty good. He wasn't the kind of person who you walked in the door and he immediately wanted to inject you with things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had, they did an endoscopy on me and, he, you know, we come back. He's like, oh, you have this thing, you know, you have this big ulcer in your duodenum. I'm like, okay. It's like, well, why do I have this ulcer? He's like, oh, he's like, I don't really know why, but we have these medications you can take. Oh, uh, yeah. Standard answer. Yeah. And, and I go, well, I go, well, what do these medications do? And he kind of paused because I, I think, you know, this was, this was almost 20 years ago. I don't think people often actually ask doctors. Right. 
what their medications were actually going to do to them. Mm -hmm. So he kind of paused and he had to pull out the medication insert and he begins to kind of look through and he goes, oh, he goes, um, it, it shuts off your body's ability to produce hydrochloric acid. And I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm an Avenger. Yeah. Like I produce high, like I have a superpower. Uh huh. Um, and then my second thought was like, if my body produces hydrochloric acid, isn't that important? L like, oh, you know, yeah. like, you know, like to me, it was just like, if that's something my body does and it's just doing it out of whack. Mm -hmm. Now you may need to shut it down for a time to repair the broken pipe or whatever. Right. But like to permanently shut down my body's ability to produce hydrochloric acid, isn't this going to have all sorts of like other effects? Pretty, yeah. Yeah. And um, he he had no answer to that mm. line of reasoning. And, and and so something kind of something kind of shifted mentally for me at that point in time like the whole way the whole way i viewed myself and my health and the world and doctors and things it it all kind of took this sudden like uh, shift uh-huh and and so i left my doctor's office and i started to read books on food and nutrition <laughs> uh, came across the work of Sally Fallon and, oh, yes. and Weston A Price yep and within six months, I was able to completely heal my duodenal ulcers through food and diet. That is powerful. And so th that is kind of how I fell into um, just real food and farming to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my wife, she was my fiance at the time. She's now my wife. We were shopping at Sam's Club and Kroger and Walmart and we went from shopping there to shopping at Whole Paycheck and Wild Oats mm -hmm. um, and then we took the gateway drugs of a CSA <laughs> and, oh, raw, yes. and, and a herd share and a raw milk dairy Yep. and so we, we slowly kind of went farther and farther down the rabbit hole until we started a local food buying club in Louisville, Kentucky I guess it's about 11 years ago now because uh -huh. we started it right around when my first child was born and a few years um, into our club's existence, we were raided by the Kentucky State Health Department. Holy shamoles, really? Oh, oh, I mean, this is, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the amount of money and resources the government wastes, um, basically persecuting small farmers and those who want to get food directly from them. Um, ju just a recent wow. example that's on our website in Texas, uh -huh. they pulled officers off of a domestic abuse complaint just the other day mm -hmm. to have them break up a raw milk delivery. Oh, jeez. So think about that. You have a family where there's active abuse going on mm -hmm. and the officer gets a phone call. Hey, Mike, you got to get over to Fifth Avenue some people who are getting raw milk are about to pick it up and they need to be stopped. <laughs> it's, it, you know, and I mean, we can get into some more stories as the show goes on. Wow, I don't even know where to go with that. Uh, well, I mean, again, I could give you dozens of examples. There's Mana Storehouse in Ohio. Uh -huh. There's there's Rossum in California that was raided with guns drawn. Like, is the broccoli and cabbage going to shoot back? Wow. Well, there was but, there was one this just this week. I have it posted on my Facebook page. A guy was growing okra in his backyard, and they raided his house. Guns drawn. Yeah, I think that I think that happened a few years ago, but I saw it ah, making rounds again okay. on social media. Uh -huh. um, and and it's and so it's it's unbelievable you know like a lot of people when when me and Kristen Canty who did the movie Farmageddon uh -huh. where she chronicles a lot of these stories in that movie we try and tell this to people and they almost look doe-eyed they just can't believe it they they can't believe that police and SWAT teams mm -hmm. and government agencies are are using tens of millions of dollars of tax money uh-huh to interfere with who you get your food from. Wow. So uh, the, the, I got to ask this question. Why? That's a, it, it's an interesting question. Uh -huh. um, I, I'm going to give you, 
a few different reasons why. Okay. So, so one reason is um, the, the the food industry in America, the food and farming segment of the economy. Mm -hmm. I submit to you is one of the most heavily regulated, if not the most regulated part of our lives. You know, people complain about the government mandating light bulbs or people complain about the government, you know, getting involved in all these areas that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And then they sit down to eat a Twinkie, which <laughs> is, you know, a, a 50 cent Twinkie that has a shelf life of 500 years or more, which only exists because of the government's absolute devastation and manipulation of the food and agricultural industries. Hmm. You know, how do we get carrots? You know, or organically grown local carrots are two to three times more expensive than Twinkies and Coca-Cola. Yeah. You, you know, how, how do we get there? Uh, you know, how do the economics of our food system make any sense when you step back? Right. It's only because they've been so skewed, mm -hmm. so manipulated, so broken by governmental policies and other involvements, entanglements. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one part of it. A second part of it. So before you before you go to the second part, so why would that, for our listeners, why would that have our police forces raiding buying clubs? Well, be, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, th this is something. Um, it, you know, especially because of the events of the past few weeks in our nation, it's something on a lot of people's minds. Uh -huh. But but we need to realize that every law and regulation that the government passes, mm -hmm. it means to enforce. And those oh. regulations are enforced by people who have access to firearms and the ability to throw you in cages. Mm. A and so, you know, we need to think long and hard. Um, we often don't consider, you know, something bad happens. So we say, oh, government, will you pass a law? Mm -hmm. Because of this bad thing that happened, and we don't realize though that that law might be used in a way we did not foresee <laughs> to to do things to people in a way we would have never anticipated. Yeah. Um, and so you know, a great example of this is Vernon Hirschberger up in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. who ended up going to a jury trial. His case drug out, I believe, over three to four years. Uh -huh. He's a farmer. I think he has 10 kids, maybe 11 kids. Uh -huh. He doesn't even have as much as a parking ticket on his you know, record. And the state of Wisconsin used well over $3 million probably <laughs> by our best estimates to try and shut down his little buying club that had a hundred families in his community that wanted to get food from his farm uh -huh. because in the mind of the state of Wisconsin, he was not complying with their dairy regulations and other food regulations. He was the one that was selling raw milk, right? Well, he wasn't selling raw milk. Um, he had, you know, people, people had an ownership interest in his farm oh, dairy, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Got it. So you got it. But also, you know, Vernon and his group would also argue, and this is actually what the jury decided, and that that they were right in arguing this, that what they were doing was private commerce. It was not public. Oh. And it was outside the purview and the authority of the state to interfere with. Hmm. Um, and, and so that's something as an organization, we really want to drive home this legal idea that you know, if people want a regulated food system, mm -hmm. they can have it, but but we should have the right to opt out. Oh, big time! Yes, you, you know, we should yep. have the ability to opt out. You know, if I want to buy a pork chop from my neighbor, mm -hmm. and I don't want that pig to go through a USDA inspected butchering facility, mm -hmm. I should have that right. If I want to get a chicken pot pie from my cousin and actually pay them money for it, mm -hmm. I should have the right to do that, even if that chicken pot pie wasn't prepared in an inspected, you know, certified kitchen. Right. Uh, and, and so that's 
you know so this the second part is thank you that's where i was going yeah. next yeah the, the second part is there are people whose livelihoods and businesses completely depend on this constricted food system on this narrowly controlled constricted tightly uh, regulated food system give us an example would you well so about 4 years ago mm -hmm. I was asked by some friends to work on some legislation here in Kentucky to help small farmers. And as part of the legislative process, we were required to go to Frankfurt, the state capital, and meet behind closed doors with other stakeholders mm -hmm. who would be impacted by this legislation. Now, in in like the most rosy colored projections for the impact of our legislation you're looking at an impact on kentucky's farm economy right. of like one tenth of one tenth of one percent <laughs> this is a minuscule rollback a, a minuscule carving out of freedom for farmers and consumers mm -hmm. so we're at this meeting behind closed doors you know, there is people from the Kentucky dairy industry, not Kentucky dairy farmers. None of these people were farmers. They're people in the processing oh. and the delivery and, and all of the, you know, there, there used to be thousands and thousands of dairy farmers in Kentucky, uh -huh. but there's two or three dairy processors. Oh. And, and this is what Rob Patel does a very good job talking about in his book. Mm hmm. And this is the end result of government regulation. You, you, you have this narrow stricture that all the farmers have to go through. You know, like when I, I decided just to get the experience, I would sell one of the cows from my farm at our local auction house mm -hmm. to better understand. And it's a nightmare. You have 500 farmers and the auction house has one person bidding on the cows. Oh, my gosh. And and so you walk in as a farmer, and whatever that guy wants to pay, you either take it or you drive back home with your cows, and you have nowhere else to sell them. So we're at this closed door meeting, uh huh, and and we begin to talk about the bill. And to make a long story short, mm -hmm. they physically threatened us with harm over our bill. Who did? The, the these other stakeholders. Oh wow, <laughs> they. At, at one point during the meeting, mm -hmm. one of the gentlemen got up and he walked over to our side of the table and he put his fist and finger two inches from one of my friend's faces. And, and he got in his fate, at face and he basically said, you better drop this legislation or bad things are going to happen. Oh, my gosh. And, and so, so that's a big part of it mm -hmm. is – you know, like there's a revolving door at all levels of government, federal, state, and, and local, mm -hmm. between these well vested, well heeled agricultural players and the regulatory offices that set policy and standards that then the average farmer has to comply with. <laughs> right. And, and they have little to no interest. You know, in doing things that actually, you know, protect and help the small farmer, because most of those things are at odds with them maintaining their bottom line and their control. Right. So, and and this is where you tie. Really, this is all about the farm to consumer legal defense fund. A lot of the work you're doing, correct? Yes, and, and so you know, so um. After they raided our buying club, uh -huh. we were we were the first group in the nation up to that point to be raided and walk away winners. Oh, um, nice! And so everybody else, Mana Storehouse, Rossum, Athens locally grown, um, they all they all ended up losing in varying capacities. Mm -hmm. Some had worse losses, some had less worse losses, and we were the first ones to walk away winners. Um, not long after that, I was invited to become a member of the board of the Legal Defense Fund, mm. which I accepted. I served as a board member, I guess for about three years. And then a little over a year and a half ago, I was asked to become the first executive director of the organization. So I stepped down from the board 
and I currently serve as executive director. Wow. Um, well, thank you for doing that, first of all. Congratulations. It sounds like a big job. <laughs> it's exciting. You know, like we're often facing we're often facing people who make more money in a day than our organization will bring in in a year. Mm, mm -hmm. And so it, you know, um, I'm always glad that I learned to play chess. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So I want to know, how did you come out a winner with your buying club? What was the, what was the, call it a trick? What, what, what was it? Well, there's no trick. You know, before, before I proposed to my wife, I took her out to eat. And over the meal, I said to her, I go, just so you know, at some point during our marriage, it, so I said, just at some point in my life, we're going, I'm probably going to end up in jail. I, I know this is totally how you propose to somebody. Um, and, <laughs> and so, you know, she, she was in love with me. So she looked at me all starry eyed and I don't think she understood um, what I was saying until a couple months after the health department raided us mm -hmm. and once life had settled down some, we're sitting at home one night and she looks at me and she goes, do you remember when we went out to dinner <laughs> and you said that you might go to jail at some point? Uh -huh. She's like, you weren't kidding, were you? Uh, and, and so part of it was just internally, I have an, an agreement with myself uh -huh. that I will go all the way. I would rather go to jail mm -hmm. than compromise my integrity in what is right. And so the FDA has said in writing, we sued the FDA a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and in response to our lawsuit, the FDA said in writing that you have no fundamental right to your bodily health. Oh you my have, gosh. You have no fundamental right to choose what you feed your family and children. You have no fundamental right to the foods of your choice. In the, writing in writing from the FDA. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It's up on our website. Oh, I'll would send love you that. the direct Please, link yes. so you can put it. Um, and so, so, you know, like the FDA has said this in writing and, and you know, my life's goal is to give them a run for their money. money on this assertion. Yeah, they wow. said, you know, um, th this is how they say they go plaintiff's assertion of a fundamental right to their own bodily and physical health, which includes what foods they do and do not choose to consume for themselves and their families, mm -hmm. is similarly unavailing because plaintiffs do not have a fundamental right to obtain any food they wish. So th this is a, so you know from the FDA's perspective, uh -huh. they are the final arbitrator of what can be grown and what people can eat in our nation. Wow, th this is a level of tyranny. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love when Joel Salatin says that the only reason there is no bill of right about food and farming uh -huh. is because the founding fathers could not imagine a day that <laughs> when it would, would be happen. necessary. Yeah. Which is sad, you know, because we'd be in a very different boat if we had at least something to point to. Not that the Bill of Rights gets all that much respect um, at the federal level anyway, but, but it would help. Mm -hmm. So – so we have these government agencies who who you know they get their funding from the FDA and the USDA mm. and this is the FDA and USDA line you know this is where they are coming from mm -hmm. you, you know that that they are the ones who arbitrate and decide what a healthy diet is who should be producing it and, and you know how those products should be consumed right and if you want to opt out of that system, they're going to come after you. So like I was fully committed when we got raided. I'm willing to go to jail over this issue. Yeah. Um, you, you know, like I'm willing to leave my wife to care for our 4.5 children by herself. Uh -huh. Then then seed the ground that the government is going to tell me what I can eat and who I can get it from. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, though, if I'm going to go to jail, I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. Oh, yes. And so when our buying club was raided, basically 
uh, you know, the way the government often wins is by making examples of single individuals. Oh, right. So, so they they go after a single farmer like Vernon mm-hmm. or like Dan Algeyer in I think he was in Maryland, Virginia area, um, or Mark Baker in Michigan. Um, you, you know, they they really try and hone in on one person, and they and they just they pile all their weight on that one person like a mountain. Mm-hmm. And so you're one little person, and you have this mountain leaning against you that is the government, this entity that literally taxes you and then uses the taxes they extract from you to prosecute <laughs> yeah. and has limitless free time and unending life to do this to you. And so I wanted to change the math of that equation. I didn't want to be bearing up under that mountain alone. Right. And so we put in our buying club, the Kentucky Health Department came on a Friday and they served us cease and desist and quarantine orders. And basically Saturday morning, we hung um, we hung partial copies of the Kentucky Constitution mm-hmm. right next to the cease and desist and quarantine orders. And we put a sign up sheet. And the sign up sheet said, you know, I the undersigned in accordance with my constitutional rights, such as, you know, Kentucky Bill of Rights Amendment 4 and 5 and mm-hmm. 7 and 16, am taking my private property. And if someone at the Kentucky Health Department has any issue with this, they can contact me at the phone number below. Mm-hmm. And we had our members, we gave our members the opportunity to join us in breaking and ignoring the quarantine. Wow. So that if the Kentucky government was going to take this to the next level, Mm -hmm. they couldn't just put me in jail now. They couldn't just put Susan in in jail now. Uh They now had a hundred some people who all, it's an all or nothing proposal. Brilliant, yes. Well, well, and it's great because you know like, Kentucky is like most states. Mm -hmm. They they, they squander the taxes they extract. Mm -hmm. They're millions if not billions of dollars in debt. Their jails are already overflowing. Their court systems are already hopelessly backlogged. Mm -hmm. Are they really going to go after a hundred (laughs) a hundred of your few remaining tax paying Mm -hmm. productive citizens? You know, our buying club is stay at home moms and doctors and college professors and lawyers and you know airline pilots and tradesmen and carpenters like you're really you're really going to come after all these different people mm-hmm. and so i tried to engineer a no win situation for the state of kentucky wow so that no matter what they did mm-hmm. they would lose at the end of the day you know so so even right. if we you know, even if we took some shots along the way, even if I did spend some time in jail, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there was no way they were going to win. And it sounds like that's what happened. Yeah. And, and you know, five days later, we received an email from the Kentucky Health Department. The, the government never apologizes. Of course not. Uh, and the government never admits it makes a mistake. They just said in the email, it was a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it was just a misunderstanding. Got it. And and so they they walked away. Um, it, 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 from what I was told by some of my friends in the Kentucky government, it was a very bad few weeks for the health department. It, it really went sideways on them. Oh, nice. Um, they, they just were not at all expecting. Because, again, up until that point, every single time something like this had happened mm-hmm. – you know, the people had been rolled. Right. Uh, you, you know, they, they had no game plan to resist and organize in a way that will allow them to win. A lot of them were very principled. A lot of them were very good hearted. Right. But they weren't really prepared. Yeah. And, you know, the great thing for us was one of the reasons we were able to win is our buying club um, is a member of Farm to Consumer. So Farm to Consumer is a membership organization. Mm. And if you're a member – you have access to a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week hotline 
where you call and in five minutes you can have a lawyer on the phone with you to help you when anything like this happens. Wow. You know, so say you're a farmer mm -hmm. and a government agent shows up at your farm for an inspection. Oh. And wants you to sign all of these different forms. One of our members had this happen last week. Uh -huh. um, I was actually on my day off and I got a text message from one of our farmer members saying, you know, I have an agent of some alphabet agency at my farm wanting me to sign these forms. What do I do? And I'm like, you call the hotline so one of the attorneys can help you. And the attorney will talk to the government agent. The attorney will be able to instruct you what are your rights in that situation. Um, the attorney can run interference and explain to a government agent if they're outside the bounds of their office and authority. And, and so it's it's such a great resource for all the different ways that farmers and growers get harassed. You know, Joel Salatin uh -huh. is one of our members. Elliot Coleman is one of our members. Wow. And, and like, you know, Joel, I would say almost once a year – has to avail himself of our help in one way or another. You know, whether it's a, an out of line local inspector mm -hmm. saying his eggs aren't up to snuff, you, you know, to all of these different stories he wow. has in his book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so, so Farm to Consumer was another reason we were able to win because we had, we already had attorneys right in there. our corner. Yeah. That if we did decide to fight it, we would have legal support that would not bankrupt us in the process. Right. Uh, it, it is, so there is a lot of things that went into it, and I'm just really thankful that, um, you know, that, that that we were able to come out on the other side in a positive manner. Right. And things in Kentucky have generally um, been on the upswing ever say, since. Overall. Good. Good. <laughs> So tell us about the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. So the organization was started in the mid-2000s mm -hmm. um, primarily because of the you know, harassment of especially um, raw milk farmers. Mm -hmm. So um, th there's a farmer in my state who was raided – in such a graphic, aggressive way, he suffered a heart attack. Oh, my gosh. He was thrown on the ground like he was some kind of mafia drug dealer. Mm -hmm. you know, it was like four different government agencies showed up um, j just totally uh, – well, you know, the Mana Storehouse raid was very similar. They're, they're kind of, I think they're like an Amish family or something similar. And there was a SWAT team sitting in their house, you know, with semi-automatic firearms mm -hmm. and full body armor over them distributing food. Um, and so, um, you know, these these farmers were just they, they were facing such incredible pressure because the FDA and USDA especially despise raw milk. Hmm. Um, so – well, and, and it makes sense though because milk – milk more than any other food in our kind of cultural ethos uh -huh. has a place of prominence and centrality. Oh, yes. And, and, and like you know, dairy is an anchor food in grocery stores. Oh, right. You know, like, like – and, and this is why the, 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 the people who pull the regulator's strings – are so serious about stopping raw milk and similar foods because of, you know, like my family, once we quit getting milk at the store and started getting milk and eggs from small local farmers, you eventually start getting everything mm -hmm. from small local farmers. Oh, right. The, the economic impact over time is immense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for the government, Stopping the growth of raw milk was a, a key way to stop the growth of this whole alternative food system where the food isn't going through all of these alphabet agencies and inspectors mm -hmm. who all have their hand in the farmer's pocket every step of the way. 
and and who you know farmers on average in the industrial food system get less than 20 cents on the dollar of what consumers spent oh i thought it was a lot less than that yeah it's you know the usda the last time that they released their food dollar thing i think it was like 15 or 16 cents mm-hmm. but but you ask well how does that happen it's because the farmers have no choice but to go through these cartel regulated systems mm-hmm. that if you seek to opt out of you you might end up in jail right you know in kentucky last i checked the farmers market handbook to like sell a head of lettuce at a farmers market was like 160 pages oh jeez you know to sell a head of lettuce and, and a, a bunch of kale uh-huh so so we we you know so for farm to consumer we you know we do a number of different things to try and push back and help um, farmers and eaters have the ability to choose who they get food from, or or to supply food to people in a way that'll be profitable for them. Um, you, you know, by either lessening regulations, mm-hmm. especially regulations that don't make any sense. <laughs> um, or, or by seeking to get laws passed, especially at the state level, right. that open up whole new options for growers and eaters to come together. Um, you know, so we have a, we have a team of lawyers and we have the hotline. Um, at times we get involved with litigation on behalf of our members where we'll defend them or we'll sue. Mm-hmm. sue the government over something that's happening to a member. Um, we engage in some lobbying um, on, on different bills, both at the federal and state level, and we work with congressional Congress critters um, <laughs> you know, to kind of get things moved along. Yep. Um, so if you Google or if you go to our website and look up the Prime Act, for instance, uh-huh. um, we've worked with Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky to introduce the first ever rollback to the federal meat inspection system, the wholesome meat wow. act and stuff. Well, and it's so necessary. If yeah. you go back to nineteen, if early 1960s, mm-hmm. America had almost 20,000 butchering options in the early 1960s. There, there is 20,000 wow. slaughterhouses, uh-huh. butchers, all of this. And there's less than 100 now. I'm well, there, there, well, there's two thousand eight hundred. Okay, <laughs> but but that does but but um, only a portion of those are USDA inspected. Mm. And, and so you know, here's the rub: if you're a small farmer and you want to sell somebody a pound of ground beef, it has to go through a USDA inspected facility, or in a limited number of states, as long as the meat is not going to cross state lines. Mm-hmm. And as long as it's not going to be sold at certain venues, it has to go to a state inspected facility. Oh, wow. I I talked with one of our members a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. He lives on the – he basically lives – his farm is like 60 miles from two adjoining state borders. And all of the big towns are over the state borders. So if he wants to sell meat – in either of uh, in either of the two best markets for him to sell to, uh-huh. he has to take his animals close to five hundred miles to get to a USDA inspected facility. Wow, it, it, it's just unbelievable. So, so you know, we work on legislation like the Prime Act mm-hmm. that would help create opportunities for small farmers. To, to have options beyond the industrial food system to get their food and products to market. When you, uh, say, when you say small farmers, what size are we talking about here? Well, you know, maybe I shouldn't use the word small farmers. Maybe I should use the word sustainable farmers. <laughs> I like it better. Or, or locally oriented farmers. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, you know, because we have farmer members like Joel, mm-hmm. whose operations, um, and you know, like the the Hits Fields, Seven Sons up in Indiana. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the, these are farmers who are operating at a multi million dollar a year scale. Uh-huh. And then we have farms like my farm that you know this year our farm will probably sell twenty or thirty thousand dollars at most. Um, you, you know, so so it's not so much about the size or scale. 
but but the values and goals yeah. and and practices mm-hmm. of our members are what we care about. Yeah. So how do I join? Um, to join, you just go to our website, farmtoconsumer.org, and there's a place you click that says join, and you fill out a member application. Is it, expen- um, is it expensive? To, um, it's $125 a year if you're a farmer. Ah, uh-huh, okay. Uh, $75 a year if you're a homesteader. Oh, I like and, that. And, and if you're just somebody who cares about farmers and food, you can be a consumer member for just $50 a year. Nice. So when you say a homesteader, what does that look like? Basically, it's somebody who's primarily producing food for their own personal consumption, uh-huh. not as a vocation. Ah, got it. You, you know, so because there's more and more people in our nation for all sorts of reasons, whether it's the prepper movement mm-hmm. Or whether it's just you know people who live in cities and, and want to make their city more resilient and more sustainable, who they're they're not growing food and harvesting rainwater in order to make a living out of it, they're doing it, um, you know, to to feed their family, um, to feed their neighbors, yeah. not not for you know not because they're economically trying to make a go of it, yeah. And we wanted to have a membership for them that still has a lot of benefits. Yay. Um, but that doesn't have, you know, because they're not making money off of doing it, mm-hmm. you, you know, so that, that it would kind of fit that niche and help them out. So our urban farmer growers out there, this is where we fall. Yeah, probably most of your urban farmer growers who, who basically are growing things for themselves and their families and neighbors. Yep. You know, you would be considered homesteaders by the organization, and that's where you would get plugged in. Fantastic. Um, and we're developing resources, you know, geared towards each kind of group. Yeah. Excellent. And wow. So I'm going to shift a little bit on you, and I, I just want to, I've got a couple of questions. What drives you? I mean, you've shared some powerful, powerful things here in the last 40 minutes. Why? What do you do? Why do you do what you do? Oh, um, because of love. Uh huh. Like, like, because I love farmers. Because I love people. Mm. Because I love my children. And, and you know, when I look at you know, there there's two things in life um, that that are the only things that really keep me awake at night. And one is when my children are older. Will they look at me and think of me as a hypocrite, as somebody who said one thing but did another thing? Uh-huh. And the other one is, will my children look at me and think, man, he talked a lot, but he, he didn't actually love. He didn't actually make good on those things he talked about and go through the hard stuff and love people. Yeah. So, so those are the two big things that, that drive me. Mm-hmm. You know, when – when you see some of these farmers or, or you know, like, I, you know, I live in a rural area in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. When you go to the auction house and you see these farmers who are fourth and fifth generation farmers and their livelihood has been destroyed mm. and their communities hollowed out and you see none of their children want to stay on the farm, you, you know, like like my heart <sighs> I, I just I break down in tears. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I'm I'm just like you know, they were they were ensnared in something that they didn't fully understand. Mm-hmm. And now their only option is, you know, every year to fall farther and farther behind because, you know, eighty four percent of, of meat consumed in America roughly is controlled by four companies. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, like, you know, these companies make all the money and my neighbors end up old, you know, working in their 70s and 80s. Yeah. And and yet totally poor and and with no hope of passing on their farm to their children like their grandparents and great grandparents did. Yeah. Yeah. And so, like, you know, I, I want to live in a world where farmers have the same kind of economic opportunity mm-hmm. as other vocations. Mm-hmm. So, and, and where they're paid fairly for their labor and products. Because yeah. farming is one of the few places in the American economy where 
you know, basically far- farmers have no control in large sections of food and farming over what they get paid for what they make. Right. You know, when that bulk milk truck pulls up to your dairy farm, <laughs> you either take what they're paying that week uh-huh. or you don't make your mortgage. Right. Because it's not like there's another dairy, bulk dairy truck coming down the road that you can sell to instead. Mm-hmm. So, yes. So, you know, it, it's it's those two things that really drive and anchor me. Perfect. You had, you had mentioned a book early on. I want to I want to talk a little bit about it. It's called Stuffed and Starved by Rob Patel. Rob Patel, R A J is his name. Oh, um, Raj, Rob Patel. Raj he, Patel. Okay. Yeah, he's Indian. Perfect. Um, yeah, and, and so yeah, you'd ask me kind of what are some books that have influenced yeah, me? Yeah, exactly. You know, Joel Salatin's books influenced me. Mm-hmm. Omnivore's Dilemma has influenced me. You know, especially that book. When you realize that the world is comprised of over six billion eaters, mm-hmm. and the world is comprised of, you know, still even there's probably ten million or more farmers in the world, right? Even though, especially in America, the farmer to <laughs> eater ratio has been going in a terrible direction for far too long. Yeah, but you, um, you know. You look, there's still a lot of farmers. There's obviously a whole lot of people eating because the population isn't going down. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are a handful of companies that control the entire food system. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking like 40 or 50, you know, international conglomerates who control, you know, maybe as much as. 70% 70% of all the calories consumed in the world each day. That's amazing. And, and you know, Rob, he uses the anal- he uses a picture of an hourglass. Uh-huh. to describe the food system. You know, and if you, you know, if you envision an hourglass, really wide at the top, really wide at the bottom, mm-hmm. but but insanely in the narrow at yeah. the middle. And and it's that middle that is cre- that has created a world where you have America where i think it was the cdc said that by 2030 mm-hmm. you know something like 30% of americans will be obese wow obese doesn't mean overweight right obese means you have a whole extra you in your back pocket mm-hmm. that you do not need and the cdc is saying you know by 2030 you know, a third of our nation wow. is going to qualify as obese. Yet, all around the world and in our own nation, mm-hmm. there's people who are starving. Right. And, and so, Patel does. He just does such a great job discussing how it is. It is the the regulatory corporate confluence mm-hmm. <laughs> that narrowed yeah. narrowed that hourglass. And if you try and go outside that hourglass, as some of the stories I've mentioned show, mm-hmm. you, you will face the full might of the federal and state government yeah. if you try and do something that is outside of that hourglass mm-hmm. that, that has created a world that is riddled with you know, two woes. I, there's, a, there's a Wendell Berry quote I love. Uh-huh. I think it's a Wendell Berry quote. But he basically says modern people specialize – in creating two intractable problems from one elegant solution. Wow. And, and and that's what we have. You know, we have this food system that's that simultaneously starves people yeah. or afflicts them with horrific degenerative diseases of all sorts. Mm-hmm. And, and so that book is it's a great read on numerous levels. Stuffed and starved by yeah, Raj Stuffed and Patel. Starved. So I have one final question for you, but I have a specific way I'm going to ask it. I don't normally do this. And that is what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? And I would like it for to, to be in the realm of what can we do about this? Well, there's a number of things you can do. You know, the first is obviously we would love to have any of you as members of our organization yep. who care about these things. I'm going to join today. Um, so, and I appreciate that so much. Yeah. So I, I can tell you, like, as executive director of the organization, we work very hard to make sure you that, – that what we do and what we do with the resources you provide us uh-huh. are, are used to accomplish 
this mission of helping people have food freedom and food choice. Perfect. That's number you know, one. The, the, the second thing you can do, um, which hopefully a lot of your listeners are already doing, is opt out of the industrial food system. Mm-hmm. You, you have never had more options to opt out yeah. than now. And we, you, by that you mean buy local, know your farmer, um, yeah, look grow for your a, own. Yeah, grow your own, join a food buying club, um, you know, like barter with neighbors. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like how often, you know, like, you know, we have a buying club and we've done all of these neat things like encouraged members because, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to go to a restaurant and get a good meal oh, in, yeah. in some places. It's gotten yeah. a lot better, oh, yeah. got way better over the last five to 10 years. Um, but, but then it gets real pricey. And right. I said, you know, well, well, you know, like why don't a group of families do a meal swap? We're like, you oh, know, that's brilliant. Because like like I have four kids, uh-huh. and so getting a babysitter and everything to go out to eat is a pain in the butt. But what if another family kind of did a dinner for just me and my wife and babysat my kids, and then we did it for them a week or two later? Nice. You, you know, there, there's all these innovative yeah. things we can do that are voting, you know, both with our pocketbooks – and and with our personal skills and opportunities, yeah. um, you know. So join a food buying club, you know. Find a farmer you can support. Mm-hmm. Learn to ferment things. You, you know, th- there's there's so many things you can do at this point that will over time make a cumulative difference yeah. and pull other people in. You know, help them understand why these things matter. Help them understand yeah. it's not okay. And it's not good for our nation that like 80% of the produce consumed on a daily basis Mm -hmm. comes from two small valleys in California. (laughs) I know, right? You you know, like, like, Mm -hmm. like, like you just think about the peril that puts our nation in. Yeah. You know, whether it's fuel prices or some kind of, you know, major earthquake or there's so many things that could, that could throw the whole thing into utter chaos and yeah. there's so much we can do to, to to help our communities and nation be in such a better place perfect well thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today it has been a treat chatting with you great well it, i've really appreciated having time with you if you ever want us back please just let us know it's been a real pleasure oh absolutely and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask all my listeners go to all right what's your website it's farmtoconsumer.org. Farm, go to farmtoconsumer.org and become a member. I'm going to do it right now. Uh, I think it's one of the most powerful things that we can do right now. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Great. Well, you can go to our website, drop us a contact form, or you can email us at info at farmtoconsumer.org. Perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Decades ago, I started growing food in my front and backyard, and I realized that my mission in life is to inspire and empower others to grow their own nutrient-dense, healthy, organic food. Because of this, a lot of people have come to me with their gardening questions over the years, and that got me thinking, what if we put together a community that would help budding gardeners blossom? So I finally made the idea a reality with my Urban Farm U member program. Each month, your membership includes three live online events, a monthly class, a chit-chat with an expert, and a monthly coaching session, plus access to the experts on our member page and a significant discount on our signature courses. I'm deeply committed to transforming our global food system, and I do this by empowering you to grow your own food. The Urban Farm Membership Program is a simple way to get going. Please join me in transforming your food system today. To learn more, go to urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. That's urbanfarmmembership.org or text membership to 33444. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. 
In the words of Vincent van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.